my name is Nicolai Nitrinduk. I live in Paris, France. I'm an art historian specialized in Vietnamese art, and I curate the Instagram account Vietnamese Art in Paris. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you after all of the work that you've done? Uh, that's that's a, a very heavy question. Um, to me, it would be both uh, pride and struggle. Um, struggle first because I'm mixed uh, and my Vietnamese identity is not necessarily the one that uh that is the most um obvious to people and it has been the cause of a bit of pain when i was growing up because i feel very much attached and connected to my vietnamese identity and so that that was a bit sad for me not to be almost taken seriously about my vietnamese identity it's also a struggle because of uh, the history, my family history, about how my grandfather arrived in France. He was forced to leave his country and to to embrace a, a, um, another way of life, another culture, without having a choice. And so it has been hard also growing up, knowing the story, uh because it's a lot of pressure uh i oftentimes felt that i was not uh worthy of this history that i was not as brave as my grandfather was uh but it's also why it makes me proud because um uh, there is the example of my grandfather but there's also the, the whole vietnamese country which is a an amazing example of what is bravery and what is strength how how the country resisted uh foreign forces for thousands of years and how how they always have faith in themselves or how yeah you have faith in yourself and know that you you will overcome and you know that you can also evolve and not losing your own identity. So yeah, that's that's something to be proud of. Uh, and I'm also very proud of being the descendant of the fairy queen and the Lord Dragon, of course. Can you tell me a little bit about your grandfather's journey? Well, my grandfather was born in Northern Vietnam. Uh, in 1924, in a family of peasant. Well, his father before him had also been taken by force by the French army for World, World War I. Um, and uh, for, yeah. And then he, he went back to Vietnam, but it, it kind of broke him and he eventually committed suicide. So my grandfather grew up alone with his mother and brother. And when he was 16 uh, in 1939, uh, so there was the war in Europe and the, the French government uh, took Vietnamese boys, uh, some voluntarily and some by force. Uh, that was the case of my grandfather. Uh, he was literally taken away from his mother's arms. That's a memory he kept all his life. And um, yeah, so he was sent to France in a ship, uh, in the ship hold, um, with no, you know, no, no, no cleanliness or anything, like really in the worst conditions. And when he arrived in France, uh, well, the war was already kind of over because the German had won the war. So the, the France was 
occupied, he joined the resistance. And when the war was over, he had the choice of going back to Vietnam, but to fight against Vietnamese people during the French and the China war, or to stay in France. So my grandfather chose to stay. And uh, yeah, he met my, my grandmother, who was an Italian woman born and raised in Argentina. So together they settled in France, not speaking uh, French, and they just got along like this. And that's the story. And did he ever make his way back to Vietnam? Unfortunately not, he never went back. Uh, they wrote, he wrote to his family, they exchanged letters, um, but he died when he was 60 in 1984. And so he never got the chance to go back to see his brother or his mother again. Oh, that's a very sad story. Yes. Did you get to meet him and get to know him? No, I did not. Um, no. Growing up, that I've always been kind of fascinated by, by him. I never knew any of my grandfathers, but um, I always saw picture, pictures of him and um, grew up hearing stories about him. And um, yeah, so I've always been very passionate about my grandfather but I never met him. He died uh, nine years before I was born. And um, is this your mother's father or is your father's, or your mother's father? Yes, yes. And did your mother subsequently get connected with the Vietnamese uh, roots or her side? Yes, um, thanks to my uncle, my, my mother's brother. He was uh, the first of this generation to to try to reach out to the Vietnamese family uh, in the late 1990s. He still had the address that my grandfather used. So he tried, he wrote a letter. Uh, our cousin in Vietnam answered the letter and my uncle was eager to meet them and to go back to Vietnam. So he said, okay, I'm gonna come. Uh, let's meet on such day in such place in Hanoi. And at the time, there was no cell phone. And even in the village in Vietnam, there was no many not, not, not many phones. But so he went to that place at, at the time of the appointment and he stayed a few hours, not knowing if the cousin would come and eventually he came. And so they met. And then my uncle stayed there. He lived there for about a year, I think. My mother, that's when she, she joined him. She went to, to visit them as well. And since then, yes, we've been in touch. Now there's Facebook, there's Instagram. So that's, that's great. It's incredible history. Yeah. And how did your mother sort of preserve or instill with, within you an interest in, in Vietnam or did that, is that just something that naturally came as a result of not knowing much about your, your maternal uh, Vietnamese side? My mother herself grew up wanting to know more about her Vietnamese side. Uh, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, 70s, from French countryside, uh, it was not an easy thing to be mixed. So my grandparents, uh, raised their kids as proper French kids, trying not to make them stand out. So they didn't teach uh, Vietnamese or, or really express their Vietnamese identity. And I think my mother suffered from this because I feel that she felt disconnected from her father. And so growing up, I've always felt that. Uh, on my uh, mother's part and also my uncle. So in turn, I, I was also attracted to that part of my identity. It, this has happened to me. I was born with an, uh, an American English name. Uh, were you given a Vietnamese name from birth? No. Uh, no, uh, actually, 
even my last name, my Vietnamese last name, uh, I wasn't born with it. Uh, I had only my father's name. And it's in 2014 that I decided to add uh, my Vietnamese name to my full identity. Uh, it was the 30th uh, death anniversary of my grandfather. And I wanted to do something special to celebrate him. So I just went to the, the city hall and asked, can we add this part? Wow. What, what do you think created this sort of interest? Um, I mean, I guess the question is more like, do you remember as a child when you started to become more interested in the, the Vietnamese side of, of your, uh, your family? I don't really remember. I feel like it's always been there. Um, in my grandmother's house, uh, in the kids' room, there was a, a big photo portrait of my great grandmother, my grandfather's mother. And so she's wearing the outside, and she, you know, she sees it like in those portraits of ancestors. And it was so fascinating for me as a kid because I knew that it was different from French culture or even from Italian culture. That was not something that I would see uh, at my other relative's house or my friend's house. And it really, it was really striking to me as a kid. I felt very proud to know that this was my ancestor. And I don't know, it felt kind of very regal, you know, and very important and mysterious because I didn't know her. I didn't know much about anything about Vietnam at the time. So it's always been there and it's growing up gradually that I started to learn more about it. Everything that you just said about that picture in your grandmother's house is how I feel about your art that you've curated. Yeah. You know, these images are ancient, they're old, they go back in time. We are all somehow linked to those images by uh, our cultural sort of uh, memories. And I mean, that's not us today. That's not us. That's not my mother. <laughs> that's mm. not my grandma. That's, that's still part of, of an imprint of something that's very almost familiar, but so distant. Yes, exactly. Um, your Italian grandmother uh, from Argentina, Yes. Did she talk much about her culture? Did you gravitate towards her life and her her um, where she grew up? Yes, much more because first I've known her for a long time. She died in 2017. So um, I was already in my mid 20s and I was very close to her, which also I think explains why I was so connected to my grandfather because I was still very close to his wife, wife. my grandmother. And um, so, yes, I, I would talk a lot about her life, her culture, her childhood, because I knew that all of this would be, was something that I would have liked to know about my grandfather, but couldn't because I, he was not around. So I wanted to, yeah, to enjoy those moments with my grandmother and talk about, about her. And today I'm very glad I did. Yeah. Because she's not here anymore to answer my questions. But uh, yes, growing up, uh, I mean, um, Italian culture is uh, a huge part of my identity, yes, because of her. You know, I, I want to get to the work of what you do, but I can't leave the family questions yet. Uh, I'm so fascinated by an Italian woman growing up in Argentina, falling in love with a Vietnamese man. Yeah. How did they meet? Um, that's, a, that's a cute story. My, gran my grandfather, after the war, uh, so he decided to stay in France and he somehow got adopted, uh, like a foster, foster parents. He needed to to have uh, French people that would take him in so he could leave the military camp. So he found this couple, uh, elderly couple without kids 
who took him in and who were then my mother and uncle's grandparents really. And that woman was a seamstress. And so my grandfather thought, why not become a tailor? So he went to Paris in a tailor, tailoring school. He learned tailoring, then he went back to the countryside and opened his tailor shop. Uh, and he had a customer, an Italian customer, who was living in Italy, but often would come to France for holidays. And that Italian man had another tailor in Milan. And his tailor in Milan was my grandmother's brother. Because in my grandmother's family, there were tailors from generation to generation for, for a very long time. And so when this customer would go back to Italy, he, he would say to his tailor, my great uncle, you know, I have this, uh, this cute tailor in France, he's Vietnamese, he's single, you have your sisters, you have your seamstresses, maybe they can get, give me their, their picture and their dress. So they did. Uh, my grandmother gave a picture with her dress out like, like a game really, because she was already dating a pharmacist. <laughs> and, wow. um, and so then he gave those pictures to my grandfather and my grandfather was attracted to my grandmother. So he wrote to her and they exchanged letters for half a year, maybe, or a year. And then during summer holidays, uh, my grandmother um, came to France to meet him. Uh, they spent the summer together. And before she was about to leave to go back to Milan, he proposed and uh, she said yes. And they married right away. She didn't even have a wedding dress. She was wearing like a, a suit skirt and uh, yeah. And after that, she, they both lived in France and that was their life now. What a beautiful story. Yeah. A beautiful like story. story, yeah. It's not some story where, um, you know, some tragic uh, meeting or, you know, some quick get together and then, you know, they just stayed for a few years and, you know, but this is sounds like an actual love story that grew over time and was uh, such a beautiful story. Yes, I love to to hear her talking about him. She was, I mean, I, I could still feel how much uh, she loved him, the way she would talk about him even um, over 30 years after his death, she was still very much attached to him and yeah. You know, when we think about those times, it's so romantic. You know, yeah. I think about and I look at the art of, of the the early days, and you know, just everything about the periods that decades before us is. I feel like sometimes with the digital age and social media, we've we've lost a lot of that uh, sort of romance, right? Yeah, it's true. That that's up to us to to make it again. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Growing up, uh, what sort of interest? Uh, what what are the things that were uh, interesting to you? Um, well, I've always been interested in history, um, things from the past, uh, whether like tales to to hear a story about the past, or just like physical things, objects, or or costumes. I've always also been attracted to um, fashion history, the the history of costumes. I think. It, I've always thought that it was very interesting. Um, not so much about art. I mean, I've always been inclined uh, to art, uh, but not as much as today. Uh, I feel it was much more about history than about art or art history when I was a kid was really, I don't know, I was really attracted to things from the past. And what did you sort of think about when you were entering in your college uh, years? 
to study? What was the question? I'm sorry. What what were the subjects that you were interested in pursuing uh, in your college uh, degree? Uh, art history. When I when I entered college, uh, I already knew that uh, that's what I wanted to pursue. Yes. And and was there a specific uh, area in art history that you wanted to study? Yes, I started by studying uh, Italian Renaissance. That was my first, uh, my first um, um, field of study. I, I, um, I have a, a bachelor in Renaissance art history. I went to live in Florence uh, for a year, which was amazing. Uh, but at some point I realized, although I'm still very much interested and fascinated by Italian Renaissance, but I felt that it was not that's exciting because it has been covered already for <laughs> um, centuries, really. And, uh, and also, strangely enough, uh, when my grandmother died, it felt like it really impacted my, my studies and my research because she was Italian. And when I was living in Florence, uh, she was still around at the time, and we would call often, and we would speak in Italian together. We something that we never did before, but I was really getting closer to her, and that's the year she died. And so after she she passed, I don't know. I felt like that was not right to keep on that track, and I wanted to do something else. And that's when I realized that. Uh, I was very much interested in Vietnamese art, and I always, I've always been frustrated that there was not enough um, books, literature about Vietnamese art. So I thought, well, that's that's a place where I can do something useful. What what year was that? Twenty um, seventeen. Twenty seventeen, and I asked that because I, you know, I tracked down. Um, people who cover the subjects for example you know if there's an article written about somebody who was a rock musician in the 60s that person uh the rock musician is interesting but to me the writer the person that pursues the subject mm -hmm. is something somebody i want to talk about because typically yeah. they have so much knowledge in the whole kind of era that they've you know they've researched for many months or years and so for you, it's, you know, I, the, the subject, the Vietnamese art history subject is very interesting, but understanding why somebody would pursue it is mm -hmm. to me very interesting. So I want to sort of get more contextual background why and how you got into the field. So my first question is when you have this uh, sort of a uh, calling to pursue Vietnamese art, what are some of the first things sort of that go through your mind to say, okay, this needs to happen in order for me to kind of get a rounded education about this field? You have this interest, right? It starts after, you know, in 2017, passing of your grandmother, and you start to develop this sort of feeling about going to uh, Vietnamese art. Well, what happens after that? What are the, the steps that you mm -hmm. have to take to pursue something like that? Well, the first thing I did, I did was to reach out to uh, professors in Parisian universities to first see if there was uh, uh, something to be done in the academic field. Like I still wanted to, to do that in university. It was not just a passion I wanted to pursue on my own. I wanted to, to get a degree and to study it formally so I could produce something. So I reached out to, to a professor from the Sorbonne University where I studied so far, and he seemed very um, positive and encouraging about it. So he, he said we should meet. And so when, when we met, uh, I still knew nothing almost. And, and so that's really him who told me how to proceed. And he, he could see that I was very passionate about it and that 
I, I would learn very fast. So uh, after that, I just um, absorbed as much as I could regarding Vietnamese uh, culture, not only art, because there's not so much uh, books about Vietnamese art. So I read everything I could find about art. Uh, but also like culture and religion, um, sociology, movies, music, uh, literature, everything that I could to to yeah to to build uh, a base of knowledge really, and I'm still doing that obviously. There is sort of um, like the earliest period in Vietnamese art Can you walk us through sort of like the the important or the major periods of Vietnamese art uh, although I'm not a specialist of the most ancient times uh, I know more about the the the, the last centuries uh, so I'm, I wouldn't be too sure about the dates for the sure. earlier periods um, I think the first um, significant period in Vietnamese art history uh, is uh, what we call today Dong Sun, Dong Shun, uh, before Christian era. Um, those are mainly bronzes. Um, no, I don't know enough of, uh, yeah, about but, ancient but, period. But, but sort of like that, sort of like um, a big milestone in Vietnamese art, right? Um, if you were mm. just to say, hey, that's like a really big cap, a really big uh, place to start is the bronze. And then where do we go from there? There's a, a period that today we call Han Viet uh, that uh, took place during the first Chinese occupation, the first centuries of, uh, of the Christian era. Um, because that's the moment when Chinese culture mingled with Vietnamese uh, traditions of the time, and there was this Chinese elite uh, of um, military governors, really, uh, that, um, yeah, that got mixed with the local Vietnamese elite. And so that's when it started to to appear a new new ornamental vocabulary and new um, shapes that were both uh, Chinese and Vietnamese, like the first the first occurrences of uh, what is Vietnamese art today, which is a, an art that is um, heavily influenced by Chinese art. Uh, so it would start at that point and then evolve with uh, ceramics from the Li dynasty around the, a thousand years ago, which were very delicate and very thin, very refined, that, that bears witness to the refinement of the uh, court of the time, of the, of the Vietnamese um, culture of the time. And then um, we could jump to the Le Dynasty in the around the 16th, 17th century, uh, which is often considered as the um, the apex of Vietnamese culture, with the most beautiful Buddhist temples and sculptures that still stand today in northern Vietnam. Uh, and then the Nguyen Dynasty uh, in central Vietnam that that um developed another another tradition in its uh, vo ornamental vocabulary it's in its motives and um and even techniques like taking techniques from china and trying to to develop uh develop them in, in vietnam with vietnamese uh, artisans and creating those those new this new aesthetic and then the, the the French occupation in the 19th 
uh, early 20th century uh, with the, the advent of a, of a European artistic point of view with techniques such as uh, oil on canvas or, um, or perspective uh, or shadows, things like that. Uh, and then uh, the uh, socialist realism from the mid uh, from the mid uh, century, uh, influenced by uh, by Russian aesthetic of uh, strong shapes and and realistic uh, depictions. I would say those are are the main. And when yeah. you and when you are uh, curating and looking through this art in Paris, uh, does it all show up in in the museums or collections in Paris? All the periods that you talk about. Um, not really. Um, first, I would say that the 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 most recent periods in Vietnamese art history are not. Uh, well represented here in Paris, uh, the everything after uh, Vietnamese independence uh, is not so much uh, valued here. Um, so it's mainly mainly yes the 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 time of the French occupation, and uh, then there are some. Uh, collectors and some museums that have uh, beautiful pieces predating the colonization, but uh, I would say that the interest is uh, is um, on the era of the colonization the most. Once uh, the French left Vietnam, it has been a, a, a very long period of turmoil and war, so I think it was not the best uh, period for artists to express themselves. Uh, that's a period when art, uh, uh, the function of art was to be uh, political and to, to be- um, Propagandized. Yes, to, to serve uh, a, a purpose higher uh, than the individual's expression, so. Yeah, makes sense what is the sort of the cutoff of uh, when does contemporary art actually start in Vietnam? Well, we often say that it started with the Doi Moi in, in the late uh, 1980s, um, because that's when the uh, Communist Party kind of um, eased its grip on artists and individual expression. Um, Really, I would say that contemporary art, in any case, is a is a matter of uh, perspective. Contemporary art is nothing more than the art that has been created in our time. Like uh, in the nineteen thirties, contemporary art was what artists of the time were producing. So there, there's always contemporary art. Mm. But yes, what we uh, imagine today when we talk about contemporary art uh, would have been born in the late 1980s. So when you started your uh, Instagram account with Vietnamese Art in Paris, um, how, can you tell me, walk me through that sort of process of putting the first image up? And did you have to think much about the curation or was it such a, just an impulsive um, action, you know, or did you think about it? You're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I already have a series of 20, 30 art uh, works that I know that I want to put out there. Or was it just very random? Well, it started in a very silly way. I just uh, went to an, uh, a pre-sale, um, a pre-auction sale exhibition to see Vietnamese artworks. And I took pictures and I wanted to share them on Instagram, but I didn't want uh, the people from the auction room, people from the art market world 
to see my personal Instagram. I didn't want to share. I wanted to share Vietnamese art, but I didn't want to share my life. So I thought I'm just going to create another Instagram account just to share the Vietnamese artworks that I see. So it just started like this and I didn't really um, think that much about it. Uh, and so when I started to post about the, that first sale, I thought, oh, but I could also talk about that sculpture in such museum or, or that statue in such streets and everything. And I could see that my following was growing and most of my followers were from Vietnam or Vietnamese, of Vietnamese descent, whether in France or in the States. So I thought, well, I should keep doing that because uh, there's so much Vietnamese art going through Paris, whether through auction rooms or in private collections or in museums. And people do not necessarily know about it, uh, but I do because I live here. And that's something I love in Paris that we have access to art from all over the world, uh, whatever the reasons, not always good reasons, obviously. So I just thought that uh, it would probably be interesting for a lot of people to see all of those artworks that were around me. How do the artwork typically in the early years arrive to Vietnam? Arrive to Vietnam? Yes. All of the works that, that you've showcased, how did they get to, I'm, I'm so sorry, how did they get to Paris? Okay. Yes. Um, well, it depends. Uh, regarding uh, artworks, from private collections, for instance. Private collectors are often uh, families of Vietnamese descent. Mm. Um, so families of uh, Mandarins, for instance, or like um, educated people from Vietnam that at some point uh, migrated to France and brought with them their own art collection and their own memorabilia really but that today are true art pieces so there's that um and then there there's the case of the museums and the auction sales uh that are of course closely linked to colonization um for instance regarding museums in the late 19th century when when france started to colonize vietnam uh, they were also interested in Vietnamese culture. They sent uh, archaeological missions over there and scientific uh, associations that settled there to study the, the culture, the civilization. Um, and so they would, they would um, simply bring back uh, stuff wow. that, that they would um, take take unfortunately sometimes yeah. not always sometimes they would like genuinely buy it from artisans when it was um new new pieces uh other time they would buy it from their previous owners like a, a high mandarin that was close to french officials and at the time uh the vietnamese elite was more interested in in westernization than in uh, in vietnamese culture so it was kind of a yeah a fair of a friendly exchange if yeah. you want <laughs> but there was also of course uh lootings um i think that's not something we talk a lot about uh we mainly talk about lootings in africa for instance Recently, uh, a museum in Paris uh, has started to, to give back looted artifacts to Benin in Africa. But it's, it seems more subtle with uh, Indochinese history. And there's some sort of um, 
I don't know. Um, it's not very much studied yet. Uh, I started to look into it. Uh, I cannot say much about it because I haven't been into the archives. Uh, I haven't looked deep enough into it to, to, to say if it's lootings or not. But uh, for sure, uh, French museums uh, have today in their collections uh, Vietnamese artworks that have been acquired by French officials during the colonization uh, thanks to their position of power and um, at the expense of uh, the Vietnamese um, people, really. That isn't, uh, um, makes no doubt to me. Yep. But to know if it's looting, it, it gets into legal stuff that I do not master. Are there museums in Vietnam that have big collections of this sort of art? Um, yes, for, um, I don't know many museums in Vietnam. Uh, I know, I mean, only in the big cities, I know that there are a lot of small museums in the countryside, local museums that I haven't been to. I know that in Hanoi, there's a beautiful museum, the, the Museum of Fine Arts that has uh, a very beautiful collection of antique sculptures and modern paintings. Um, and much more comprehensive, fortunately, than what holds, uh, what hold French museums. That being said, um, yeah, that being said, I, I, I still think that they do not have enough uh, pieces. Uh, Vietnamese museums should be, uh, yeah. They, they should have more than what they currently have, I think. But it, it may gradually get to that because uh, today we see on the art market many, many uh, Vietnamese billionaires who buy um, priceless artifacts. Um, some uh, announce that they will give uh, pieces to museums in Vietnam. I don't know if it has happen yet, but I'm hopeful for the future that the Vietnamese uh, collectors will, uh, will help museums to, to replenish. Can you talk about some of your favorite artists uh, of the period that you study and why uh, they are your um, favorite and why you like them? Um, Yes, for instance, I, I, I really love uh, Mai Tu, uh, who lived from 1906, 1980. I think his uh, story is interesting because it really, uh, it really epitomized uh, the history of uh, Vietnamese modern art of the 20th century. He was born in a, in a Mandarin old family. His father was a Mandarin, the governor of Bac Ninh. And uh, he studied at the uh, Fine Arts School of Indochina. And um, that's what's really fascinating about those artists is how their style evolved during their career um, and really shows their own relationship to their identity. Like for instance, this painter, Mai Tu, started with oil on canvas paintings, which is a, a, a very European technique. Mm -hmm. And he would paint in a very realistic manner uh, with shadows and you know, perspective, all those things that he would learn at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts d'Indochine. And um, at some point he moved to Paris in 1937 and he settled there in France. 
And that's when he stopped uh, painting with oil on canvas and in that realistic manner. And he started to go to uh, colors on silk and to paint in a very um, idealized manner without shadows, without perspective, and really embrace uh, a Sino-Vietnamese approach to art wow. with, the, with the idea of, um, of depth not expressed through, through perspective, but through a layering of planes. And instead of shadows to have like pure flat colors, and instead of having realistic bodies and faces, it would be more um, distorted. Distorted with another cannon with uh, heavier heads and and um, more minimal face features and bodies that would be more delicate, like a, a whole other uh, approach to depiction that was much closer to what you could find in Chinese or Vietnamese art predating uh, the, the colonization. And I think that's interesting because at the time he was not living in Vietnam anymore. And I feel like it was his uh, way of... of um, Returning. Yes, of keeping uh, a, 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 a powerful connection to his identity and to his uh, to Vietnamese art history. Um, th that painter in particular, I like him because he reminds me of my own grandfather who, would, who was also a painter, an amateur painter, but painter nonetheless. And he would also paint uh, very idealized figures and uh, Vietnamese landscapes. And so I feel like this is really interesting to see how people with such different backgrounds, my grandfather was a peasant, my two was a, a son of a Mandarin, one was self-taught, the other was taught from uh, the French uh, fine art school. But in the end, they used art uh, the same way to feel closer to their homeland and to express their their longing to sublimate their longing and that's what i like about him now is there any um writings from my two uh that he leaves behind to sort of walk us through the what he was thinking uh, during the transformation of of that sort of period in, in his life that's a good question uh I don't know about that. Uh, I know that there are some interviews, even um, filmed uh, interviews. Um, there's also his uh, daughter, who today is in charge of his um, heritage. Uh, but uh, yes, that's a good question. I don't know exactly what uh, motivated him to operate this change. I know that there's also a, a pragmatic uh, aspect to it that now he was in France and it was also a way of uh, um, stand out uh, from the other artists at the time. So he knew that he would be the only one to do that at this place and time. Uh, but I do think that there were that there were uh, deeper motivations behind. Yeah, it's always so interesting, you know, as uh, somebody who is not very familiar with art for, you know, from for me, and I've been to museums, and I've, you know, stared at paintings and, and trying to understand the, the different motivations with artists. But when I learn that it's always the same for me when I learn that an artist really knows how to draw and draws mm -hmm. with shadows and perspective and really knows what they're doing. And then they switch over to um, a different mode of art. It's always interesting to me, the motivations from why they switched over, you know, what are the reasons in that sort of time and space in history that they switch over? And it sounds like that return to identity with with the shapes and with the way that he's um, almost like flattened out the perspective or taken it out uh, is, is so interesting to me. Did did he end up staying in France or did he ever go back to Vietnam? 
Um, he went back uh, for a few months in the 60s and then again in the 1970s. But he, yeah, no, he lived in France uh, all his life. Um, but he always felt very attached to his, uh, to Vietnam, really. Uh, he was not the only Vietnamese painter who moved to Paris and settled there in France, uh, but he was definitely the one who was the most affected by what was happening in Vietnam with uh, the American war um, and the, the, the French war before that. And he was, um, you could see that in his painting. Uh, and also even in his um, political approach to art, um, some of his, of his um, fellow, artists uh, that moved to Paris with him. Uh, at some point, they signed a deal with a very prominent American gallerist. Uh, and Mai too refused because it was at the time of the American war in Vietnam and he felt that it was not right. Um, he was also at some point um, doing uh, some sort of collaboration with the UN. Um, he would draw uh, cute postcards of children that would then be sold uh, for charities. And uh, he also uh, ended that collaboration at some point because he felt that there were not uh, um, he wished that they would sanction the the uh, the actions of the states during the American war, and he was disappointed in them, so he stopped to work with them as well. So that's also something I find interesting in his work because too often uh, Vietnamese artists uh, in France um, kind of, that's my opinion, of course, but kind of uh, lose uh, that connection to, to Vietnam. And, and that's something that really touches me about my two, how even far away and living in France, he would still be concerned about what was happening in Vietnam. Um, I want to ask you a question that is um, a little bit removed from the art world right now is uh, sort of how, how much do you know about uh, the Vietnamese uh, migration patterns uh, from Vietnam to to in the in the very early days of, of the history of, of the migration of Vietnamese to France? Um, I think it started in the late 19th century or early 20th century. Um, from what I know, the first to, to, to migrate would be um, educated people from Vietnam, like Sons of Mandarins, who thanks to colonization would get in touch with um, the Western knowledge and way of life and that they would be attracted to that and, uh, and move to France to study, for instance, to go to French or European universities uh, and get degrees and often go back to Vietnam. Uh, so that's, that's one point. Uh, Another one is um, linked to um, to the walls, to the two world walls, uh, as my grandfather or great grandfather, many many men were brought to France to to fight, and many of them settled. Um, so that's also, I would say, the the second act of uh, the Vietnamese diaspora in France. Um, there's also another story of family legend that have, I, I never got the chance to, to check. I never found any information, but in my family, we say that my great-grandfather uh, 
was um, sent to um, what is now, I mean, it was already Egypt, uh, to uh, dig the Suez Canal. At the time, he was engineered by French, I think. And that's what's been said in my family, but I never found any, any documents talking about Vietnamese uh, workforce for this project. So I don't really know where it comes from. Uh, if they got mixed up in the name of the canal or something. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, to say that uh, the early days of migration is very much linked to, uh, to French uh, enterprises, whether war or engineering. And then they, they, they are the, 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 the migrations linked to the independence of Vietnam and the wars. You, you know, when I was a child, I, I can imagine other children thinking about this, but when I was a child, I always thought like history happened when I was born, right? Because you yes, just, yes, I know that thing. Yes, <laughs> you just don't know what happened before your life. So you, you know, as a child, you just think, oh, life happened like the world was created right when I was born, and and slowly it's like an onion; it gets peeled back, and there's layers. In the same way, I always thought that Vietnamese American history, uh, the Vietnamese Americans were the first Vietnamese outside of uh, the, outside of Vietnam. So. Mm -hmm. There was no context typically for, uh, for, for me growing up that there, and there might have been, they, there might have been discussions in my family, but, you know, we don't, as children, we don't really think that there's Vietnamese in France, Vietnamese in Germany, Vietnamese in Australia. Yeah. So now I'm fascinated by uh, the populations that grow up outside of Vietnam, outside of the U.S. that are Vietnamese, mm. and I'm beginning to learn um i started to realize it many years ago but i'm beginning to learn in depth now detail that the vietnamese in france are perhaps the 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 oldest uh in terms of like a, a big population mm. migrating outside of vietnam it was in france they're very french vietnamese are very different than the u.s the, the vietnamese in the u.s and it's it's different in terms of the political reasons mostly um, why we have left the country. Mm. And I feel like the, the French Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese living in France have a much longer, long, long history. It's not like in the seventies or the, now I'm, I'm hearing it's beyond the fifties. It's much, yeah. much deeper than the fifties. And it's fascinating. Uh, Do you interact with a lot of Vietnamese uh, in, in France uh, today? Um, yes, I do. Uh, first, thanks to Vietnamese arts in Paris through Instagram, I talk with a, a lot of a lot of uh, individuals of Vietnamese descent that live today in, in France. Um, and then through through my research, through my studies, I, I've met a lot of um, of families and collectors of Vietnamese arts. Uh, it, has, it has always been very interesting um, encounters to, to know more about uh, other family histories. Um, and then my, my, my friends that I've met here in Paris, I, at some point I went to um, a school um, a school that has a, a, a terrible name uh, that is called uh, the, the National Institute for uh, Languages and Civilizations of the Orient. Mm. <laughs> I, I think they, they should uh, yeah. do something about that name. But that's where I started to learn Vietnamese. Uh, and so I met a, a, a lot of good friends there. Now, how much art do you think that you've come across in terms of the history of that period that you're studying is do you do you think that there's a lot more of it because I've, i'd imagine like when you study a certain period there's a finite amount but do you feel like that there's a lot more art 
that is out there that hasn't been explored by yourself? Or have you, do you kind of understand that there's this much and you're going to cover this much in your, your, in your career? Or are you on the path to discovering much more out there within this certain time frame that you're studying? Um, that's a good question. Um, that's something that is particularly exciting about Vietnamese art is um, the lack of big national collections. As we said, it's mainly, I mean, a lot is in private hands today. And thanks to, uh, thanks to that, it, it allows the knowledge about Vietnamese art history to be uh, always uh, evolving because um, with a peer on the market, a piece that you would have never thought about couldn't exist. And so sometimes it's just, um, yeah, it's very exciting to see uh, that it's um, much more diverse than what we know. And it's also very um, encouraging because it makes you think about all those amazing pieces that are yet to be seen and that are today in some French property attic or something that hopefully someday will reappear and hopefully go to a Vietnamese museum, for instance. Um, as for my specific field uh, topic of research, which is portraits uh, in Vietnamese art, um, it's also something that uh, I feel I will not cover in my career because uh, I'm lucky enough to study such a, a wide topic, um, regardless of the period or of the technique material. So with that as well, there's always new things to discover and, and always opportunities to be surprised. Is this style of art, uh, the portraits, are they, is it reappearing today in Vietnam in another iteration, another style developed? I think it never disappeared first. Uh, that's something that I find fascinating about portraits is that it's probably the one genre that never disappear because that's how humans are, they, they represent themselves. And um, so it just evolves. And that's why it's so interesting to study um, when you realize how how so little change from two um, thousand years ago until today, uh, some things are still the same in the way we, we choose to, to, to represent ourselves or the reasons why we choose to represent ourselves. Um, but beyond that, other things change like the, the, the aesthetic of it or the uh, capacity oneself has to get his portrait or her portrait done while in the past not everybody could today everybody can Don't and so those things evolve uh, and that's that's very interesting and I hope I can include uh, the contemporary very contemporary period in my thesis in my doctoral thesis because I see today how families in Vietnam, including mine, how much they love to pose and go to uh, professional photographers. And um, now I see so many people uh, interested in uh, costume, like historic costumes, dressing as emperors or mandarins and, and taking pictures in that sort of costume. That's something that was not around like 10 years ago. And today that's, that's very very um, trendy and I think that's very interesting to to see how how portraiture evolves it's funny when people get dressed up in the Mandarin costumes and 
you know, there, there's certain implied meanings behind, uh, you know, those sort of costumes that are sort of probably lost on, on the public, right? The implications yeah. of, of being ruled or what kind of um, dark history that, that exists with those kinds of costumes. Yeah, it's true. Um, I often think about it also, apart from uh, costumes of Mandarin and emperors, uh, also the simple fact of dressing in a past period to dress, to, to have that sort of uh, fantasy about um, the past, uh, especially now I see a lot of people dressing uh, like in the 1930s in Vietnam, like that style of Aozai or yeah. hairstyle. And from my point of view here in France, being French and uh, of Vietnamese descent, I wonder why would you dress like during the time of colonization? Why would you fantasize about such a dark past time? Yes. Yeah. But I realized that it's my point of view because uh, it's very much linked to my own history. But for other people, especially when you still live in Vietnam, you have a different relationship to what was colonization. And I came also to understand that apart from this period being a time of colonization, it was also a period before war, before, uh, I don't know, um, 50 years of war. And I think that's also probably why uh, people uh, fantasize that much about that period. It was just uh, the last period of peace that there was. And it's romantic. It was very romantic. Yes. Period. Vi yes. Visually romantic. The visually romantic era. Yes, exactly. Removing the political sort of backdrop. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's also, yes, an aesthetic. Uh, an aesthetic, yes. Yes. I mean, even in the architect, uh, the buildings of the time, it's, just, it's such a, you know, when you go back to Vietnam, you can feel it. It's, it's palpable. It's things that you can yeah. experience in a way that's very romantic if you remove the political, uh, the meaning, the, the, the political implications behind it. Yeah, the atmosphere is very different. Yes, it is. What about counterfeits? Do you, um, is that a big thing in this niche of, of art? Um, unfortunately, yes. Oh, um, I was expecting no, it, you know, it's not a big thing. Oh, uh, no, it is. Um, whether it is ceramics or paintings, um, yes, there, there are a lot of of uh, fakes, uh, both on the market and in museums, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it's very well known that uh, Hanoi Museum of Fine Arts uh, holds a lot of uh, fake uh, artworks, um, unfortunately, for, for many different reasons. Uh, some artworks were being have been copied during the war to be to replace the original artworks in case of uh, bombings or mm -hmm. things like that. And through time, we lost track of the original pieces, for instance, um, or, or, or simply because the original pieces are kept in their original temples, so they, they exhibit uh, copies, but then if we lose the temple, we just have the copies. Uh, and also just, um, yeah, counterfeit just to, to, to make money, like, uh, yeah, the fake art markets. And uh, fortunately, there, there, there are some uh, specialists, experts that, that spot those uh, those fake artworks and um, sometimes uh, auction houses listen to them and take those pieces out of the sale. Sometimes they don't, and that's a, that's a shame. But uh, unfortunately, 
that's how the market is. I mean, with any kind of art, there's always counterfeits. I guess it's too tempting to make money out of it. Yes, I can imagine. Now, when when you are all finished with your work, um, your graduate studies, uh, and and you head down a professional career path, uh, and you do research, uh, what does that look like on, in terms of a project? You know, if you say I want to start to study this, how do you sort of pick uh, a uh, a topic, and what happens in the pursuit of that in a certain amount of time? I think I, I will definitely keep studying portraits for sure because I know that I will not be done talking about it even after my doctoral thesis. I also intend on um, studying, keep studying uh, what we call modern art, uh, Vietnamese modern art, uh, meaning the, the first half of the 20th century because that's a, a period that I find fascinating. Um, I don't know yet exactly what I'll be doing after after I graduate. Um, that's that's one of the reasons why I'm still uh, in university because I don't know yet <laughs> what I want to do uh, career wise with my life. So I figured for now I just love to study and do research. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I may keep doing research yes and I, I have many ideas of articles uh, I want to 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 write uh, um, topics of, of research I want to dig into I, I tell you what's amazing about this period in our life right now uh, with social media that you can collect a bunch of art on your page and somebody like me or you know my friends are looking at it and we're talking amongst each other and now we're here, we're, we've spent uh, time talking about the history of this stuff, but you haven't even finished any, you know, your studies, but we're now still able to talk about the work that you've already done on Instagram, because that in itself is a, a collection. It's a body of, that, that explores your taste and a history of your roots and where you come from. So it's its own sort of work that we can study together uh, as the public. We can get to know you. We can get to know why. You, you mm. know, because for me, like I said uh, you know, um, earlier, when I look at the work, it's interesting. But then when I study the person who's collecting the work or putting together the work, to me, that oftentimes is a bigger story for me. And And I think that it's so wonderful that you have many more years to develop from where you are right now uh even though you've you you have a body of work that just collecting and curating this stuff is a, a great starting point for vietnamese around the world to start to take notice and be more aware of where we came from and perhaps where we're going yes exactly that's also how i envision this uh, Instagram account, uh, oftentimes I use it as my own um, notebook. I, I would post about something just because I want myself to remember such facts about such artists. And, and yeah, the simple fact that I can open Instagram, go to one of my previous posts and be like, oh yes, that's, that's what I wanted to say about that artist and use it uh, somewhere else like a public um notebook uh that that's how i i perceive uh research how i perceive um my 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 job as an art historian um i know some people who who wish to to keep information for themselves, uh, factual informations or, or pictures, and um, like it was their own precious treasure, very proud of, of finding those pictures. And I know this pride, sometimes I find pictures looking through all newspaper, suddenly I will find a picture of a painting or a very rare picture of the emperor or something like that. And I, 
And I think, well, that's amazing. I'm sure nobody has seen that picture in a long time and that it would be amazing for people to see that again. And that's what I love to do, to share what I find because I have the training to search information and uh, that's what I've been trained for, to, to look for knowledge and to produce knowledge. So there would be really no point in me keeping those information just for the simple pleasure of having that information for myself. And I, I just want to, to share what I find because that's, that's not mine. And also because growing up, I wish it was easier to find those informations. Today, it's, as you said, it's an amazing time we're living in thanks to internet and social socials um but we didn't have that when we were growing up no. so today i want to make sure that uh that we can use it uh yeah to to share everything that's valuable you you know today you have uh inspired me to think about um my own instagram personal instagram i have the vietnamese podcast instagram which is growing um with the team of people that i work with for social media but for my own i i've had that uh, uh, Instagram account for many years, zero posts, and I have maybe 125 uh, friends yeah. on it, but zero posts. And I just use it so I can, you know, follow other people and learn. Mm -hmm, I see. After today, what I'm going to do is collect uh, profiles in Vietnamese history and people and just post it because these aren't people I am interviewing or I haven't had a chance to meet or anything, but there's so many people that I keep a list of and I'm going to start doing what you do. I'm going to, you know, you've inspired me to, to use my personal to, um, post probably daily because there's so many Vietnamese people across the world that, that have passed away or that I can't reach but that I would mm. like to profile just what you do with, with the portraits. You, you write a, you know, a brief snippet, um, yeah. a brief on what it is. And my personal uh, Instagram account is not my American name. It's a oh. Vietnamese name that's combined. Yeah. So, yeah. So today I think uh, is another um, milestone in sort of like the development of my own. Um, I'm not comfortable with social media, but I think this is a way to get integrated into uh, the Instagram um, actions. Mm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> do you um, practice any art? Do you uh, paint or do sculpture or ceramics or anything? No, I think studying art that much makes me uh, too uh, humble. Like I, 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 I know I know how great artists can be and how great art can be. Uh, that's too much a pressure for me to, I do, I like to, to create, of course. I think most humans do too, because we need to, to express things. I do love to, to write or to draw, but um, I wouldn't call it, Art is just self-expression, just to release my my inner thoughts. What about music or any other art form? Do you do you consume uh, outside of uh, you know portrait? What 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 other kind of art do you like to uh, to really follow? I'm very much a visual guy, so it's mainly painting, sculptures, photography, or cinema, and much less. Uh, the other senses I, I'm I have uh, I lack a musical culture I'm very bad in musical culture uh, theater I'm very bad at it too uh, I almost never read novels because I'm always reading history books and essays uh, I love poetry but uh, same I do not read as much poetry as I wish I I would. Uh, speaking of film, you have um, the last emperor of Vietnam uh, posted on your Instagram. Uh, I can't remember. It's, it's Kai. Oh, yeah, that's the penultimate. That's the father of the last. Oh, father of Bao Dai. 
Yeah, bow down. It's the last father. Um, where where did you get that? Oh yes, uh, those are for from the archives of uh, Gaumont Pate, uh, which are two uh, historical cinema companies that merged into one archive. Uh, they still exist and still produce movies today, but in the early 20th century, they would send uh, camera operators all over the world to, to record images. And uh, they have uh, a database on internet. Um, unfortunately, it's not free. That's why it's only uh, like bad quality and only extracts. Uh, of the of the full videos but um when you look into it uh like the videos i've shared this is so incredible to see those images because we always see vietnam through old photographs when we have photographs and to see them moving and just it gives a whole other dimension to the past. It really gives another, um, yeah, it makes it more attainable, more real. Yeah, if you, if you think about it, we actually move differently than we did a long time ago. Our movements are different. Our yes, talk also, is different. Yes, yes. So when you witness that, it's uh, you are really in a different dimension because the movements of the the, the is it a king or an emperor? That's a good question. For for Vietnamese history, it's an emperor. For okay. Chinese or French history, he's a king. What's the difference? Um, well, the hierarchy is different. Of course, the emperor is above the king. Um, so for Vietnamese history, uh, their sovereign, the sovereign was the emperor um but as the chinese the i mean china the uh, chinese empire uh was um i don't know the english term but was um uh, more powerful what the, the 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 king i see i kind of under i think i understand so the king of vietnam is still a subject of china or of france Yes, yes, exactly, kind of. That is dead. when uh, when, when French uh, took possession of Vietnam, uh, they destroyed uh, the seal uh, that was marking the the Vietnamese emperor as a subject of the Chinese emperor, and so with that symbolic um, action, uh, it's like they replaced uh china in being uh the the the, the sovereign over vietnam oh, really that distinction is crazy i have never even thought about i've never heard of that in my life yes the difference between a king and an emperor is relative to the country that's ruling over vietnam yeah that pardon my french well, that's fucked up <laughs> really Jeez. fucked up thought right like they're taking the stamp that that China says, oh, I I own that country. And as the French, we take it over. And now we are the. Yeah, exactly. Um, that. Yes, uh, yes. It's so fascinating. It really is. Nikki, I, I really appreciate today. Um, this has been a fascinating uh, time to sit with you. And I, like I tell all my guests, I look forward to many more conversations with you uh, in this field. And uh, I'd love to see you grow. And uh, as our podcast uh, grows, we want to stay connected to hear more stories of, of what develops in your world. Thank you. That was, that was my pleasure. Uh, is you. there anything other uh, that you'd like to, to, to cover? Would you want to add to, uh, the story today. Well, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about academic work and my, my Instagram account and my own history. Uh, I would also like to say to you and to everybody that listened to your podcast to keep being curious and to be 
interested in Vietnamese art and Vietnamese history because if you look into it, uh, it's much wider, much diverse, more richer uh, than we imagine and that we've heard about. And that's also our legacy and it's worth uh, looking into. Thank you so much, Nikki. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran and Javier Proenza. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts. Thanks again for listening.